Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. We'll get underway in just a moment. Just a number of people still coming in with a minute to go. Hope everyone's having a great Saturday. How's your Saturday going, Jason? Outstanding. It's a, a beautiful, probably 23, 24 degrees. I mowed the lawn this morning. Had a couple of cups of, cups of coffee at the coffee shop with some mates and some nice cars. And I'm going to tackle this and then I uh, might get outside and, and do a bit of pruning. Sounds like a good afternoon. All right, we're almost there at two o'clock. Just a couple of more still coming in. All right, we'll get started, everybody. Uh, once again, for those who have just joined us, thank you very much for making the time this afternoon to sit in on today's landscaping event, uh, a DIY backyard landscaping webinar uh, with our host, as you can see in the screen there, landscape expert and award-winning landscape designer, Jason Hodges. I'll introduce Jason in a moment, but just before we get started, uh, by way of introduction, my name's Paul. I work with Adbri Masonry. Uh, we're Australia's leading masonry manufacturer, and we produce a range of concrete bricks, besser blocks, pavers, and retaining walls, which are for use in backyard projects. Uh, we work with Jason in the capacity of uh, a brand ambassador, and we've been working with Jason for six or seven years now, gaining insights and expert advice from, uh, from Jason. Really excited to be able to share that insight and professional knowledge with everybody on the call today. Just a little bit of housekeeping, as this is a live landscaping webinar, we do have all participants on mute. That is just to stop the sound of, you know, lawnmowers in the background or Jason mentioned he's going out doing some pruning. So uh, just stopping that as well. We do have an opportunity for questions uh, which have been submitted in advance. And thank you everybody who's taken the time to submit those questions. There were lots and lots to get through, so we'll do our best. The format of today's session will be, we'll be going through the content first. That'll take approximately 45 minutes with Jason sharing his hints and tips and stepping us through the important things to know about backyard landscaping. And then we'll get to questions at the end. So if you'd like to stay on for the entire thing, fantastic. Otherwise, if when it comes to questions, uh, if you'd like to jump off, that's okay as well. And just a general note, a copy of this webinar will be sent to everybody immediately following uh, the event. Uh, the last thing that I'll just take the opportunity to say before we get uh, to introducing our host is that there is a door prize today. And one lucky winner who's joined us on the call today is actually going to win a one-on-one -on -one virtual consult with Jason to talk more about and more openly about some of the backyard planning challenges that are really specific to uh, their needs. And as I mentioned, we'll draw that at the very end and we'll touch base afterwards. So with all the formalities done, uh, Jason, I'll introduce you. Um, mate, where, where are we joining you from today? Well, uh, at the start of the year, we moved down to Barry. Danny, she's just got excited because I started talking. Um, we moved down to Barry, which is two hours south of Sydney. And I just read a note there from Karen O'Sullivan in Melbourne saying, very jealous coffee shop. I'm so sorry. On behalf, like, honestly, the rest of Australia is so feeling for Victoria at the moment. And, you know, it's important that we all do the right thing. We did go to the coffee shop this morning, but we're all standing pretty much on the back of our trucks and, and a good couple of metres away. And, um, yeah, to Victoria, I'm, I'm so sorry. And, and the rest of the country has truly uh, got your back over this, over this period. But... Um, pretty lucky to be outside of Sydney because Sydney didn't do so well. And um, two hours down here, little family, six acre block, run my boxes, living the dream. Um, and I'm lucky enough that uh, with facilities like this that Adbro's put on, that I can still talk to so many people and, and try to do a little bit of good in their gardens. Perfect. Okay, so we're here, Jason, first week of September. Uh, tensions are turning towards the outdoors. Uh, can you tell us? Why is spring the best time to be in the garden? Well, you've only got to look at your garden to know that 
It's renewing itself. It's refreshing itself. It's cleaning itself up. It's coming to life. And so it's the easiest time to work with nature, but it's also the easiest time to do the work. I mean, 24, 25 degrees today is super comfortable compared to 35 or 40 that I might get in December and January. And, you know, it was only a matter of three weeks ago that Canberra had snow. Um, it was pretty cold in Victoria, and now you're getting 20 degree days. So, you know, if you're in Queensland, it's going to be a warm, hot summer because it has been every year since mankind. So it's important that if you're going to tackle a job, that you do it now. If you're going to plant a garden now, do it now so the plants get established for that warmer weather. The ground's warming up, the day's getting longer, and it's still really easy for us to do the work. And so I just think it's a great time to refresh and sort of rejuvenate the garden. Perfect. And so just um, <coughs> through what you're going to talk to us about, Jason, uh, the first thing is, you know, your favourite room in the house. And then we're excited to get some professional insight from you about the six principles of landscape design. And this session will be focused on that planning element. Uh, also, we'll talk through the four essential considerations before starting any backyard planning project. And then we'll also be talking about how to unlock the true potential of your place. And Jason will show us just how to maximise the value of your land by unlocking that potential uh, on that blank canvas. We'll then finish with an introduction to the top seven project ideas for your home, followed by some Q&A, and as mentioned, we'll draw the winner. So with that said, Jason, can you talk to us about the primary reasons that you recommend that people do invest in outdoor projects? Well, it's a great financial investment. would probably be the capitalist and the, the driving force for a lot of us. But secondly, it's what it does for our lifestyle and our families. Um, the first one, the, the real estate one, they say that every dollar well spent on a, on a house, you get $2 back. So if you buy a house that's unrenovated, the land's already worth so much, the same as your next door neighbours and the one up the road. So say if the medium price of your land is half a million dollars, and then you're only paying extra for what's on top of it, the house and the garden. If you go and spend a dollar well, you can double that. So that's pretty good investment for your money. You can't get that in the market. You can't get that in the bank. But I actually think with a garden, you can actually get more than doubling your money. I'll use the example of a mate of mine bought a house next to a petrol station. And he walked out his back door and you saw a petrol station. So then you heard a petrol station. Then you smelled a petrol station. And you thought, no wonder he bought this place cheap. Well, he planted one hedge along that um, side that was the, the neighbour with the petrol station. And he put in a little sunken entertaining area. So the backyard was relatively flat. He went down another 600 mils. So you were sitting down kind of in a, a little area like a cocoon. Two years later, the hedge is up high in the fence. You walk to his back door. You can't see the petrol station. When you can't see, you can hardly hear it. And when you can't see, you can hardly smell it. And he tripled the value of that property in about three years. Now, the market went up a bit, but he turned it from being the house next to the ugly petrol station to the beautiful house that it was. And I know that he didn't spend a huge amount of money. He just did really practical things like growing that hedge. And the example I like to use is you go and put in a brand new bathroom or a brand new kitchen, and the best they're ever going to be is before you've used the bathroom. Trust me, if I've used the bathroom, it's never going to be the same again. And if I've cooked in that kitchen, chances are I've banged something up or I've burnt something already. So the best they're ever going to be is day one. The best a garden could be might be five years, 10 years, 50 years down the track. So, you know, an investment in a small plant, in a paving area, and you get big bang for your buck too. So what I like about what we're doing today, it's not just all about ad -bri products and we're selling your ad -bri products. That's just a consequence of you actually doing your garden. But if you go and put a really nice entertaining area in at home, you don't have to worry about the walls. You don't have to worry about the roofs. If you do put some lights in, they're a lot cheaper than the lights that you put through your house. You're not heating it. You're not underfloor heating it. You're not doing all these things. So you can go and do an area six by four, which is the size of a large room in the house, for about a tenth of the price or even less. And yet you can make your living space that much bigger. And so I think, yes, it is a great investment financially. But the next one is that investment in life and, I, and your family and your lifestyle. And I use the example of, I know when my house isn't looking that great, that we tend to eat out and go to other people's houses. And I know that when it's on point and the hedges are done and the hedges are clean and the lawn's mowed and there's no weeds in the garden, I love nothing more than having everyone in my house. And I'm a pretty social guy. And the best thing about having it at your place 
is you can be social for longer because you're not getting last drinks, you're not getting wound up, you don't have to worry about driving home. You're comfortable. As soon as you're bored and tired with your friends, you can walk inside and go to bed. So I reckon it's the best nightclub in town is your own backyard. And that's just using it for social things. But watching your kids grow up, ride their first bike, all the things you can do safely in your own backyard when it's done well, well, they're priceless, aren't they? So I think it's pretty cool. What else we got there? So we've so talked about... Do you have... I was just going to say, uh, obviously, Jason, you've mentioned the financial investment, the lifestyle investment. Uh, one thing that comes up a lot is, um, and you just touched on then, you know, the garden can grow with us. I think you, can you talk about that and how that can be a benefit as well? Yeah, I, I know I've done uh, multiple cases where um, what started out as a little herb patch and veggie patch because parents had three and four and five and six-year-old kids might turn into a veggie garden. And then when they're teenagers and they're not interested in it anymore, you might just plant something like a lemon or an orange in the middle of it and plant ornamentals underneath it. So the garden bed can change, even though your landscaping has it, your hard stuff, but it changes the look of the place. You're using it as a sandpit maybe as first, then putting some herbs in and moving to veggies and then a fruit tree afterwards. Um, but, you know, with the world being busier and, and crazy as it has been in 2020, I think that safety, security, that comfort, that, chill out zone, that place where you can get fresh air, the, you know, when, when the family's in the backyard, they're actually, they might, like dad might be on the barbie and, and mum might be doing something and the kids might be playing, but you're actually doing it all together, even though you're doing different things. If you're inside a four bedroom house with three en suites and a computer room and a study, there's four people or five people in a house and you might not see anyone for an hour. So I just think that reconnection and that um, sort of breathing space, you can have all of that within the one area in the backyard just by, by creating zones that you can use for the same thing, like whether you're entertaining on it, but then kids can ride scooters and push bikes and things on it safely, or you create contrast. So you've got the lawn where you can fall down and wash the car. The kids can play a bit of tackle footy and cricket, and then you can be in the patio area, the entertaining area, and you're all in the same space, which is very different to houses with walls. Another, another thing I reckon is houses are complicated to build and little DIY jobs at home are a great way to make your place your home, your house, turn your house into a home. And if you think back a generation ago, it would have been nothing for our parents to be owner builders. And now when you hear someone do it, you go, oh my God, you could lose everything. Do you know what you're doing? And so not saying going to that extent of being an owner builder, but you know, if you wanted to tackle a paving job, it is not beyond the realms of possibility that most people could do it. And for the few people that might struggle, I bet you they've got a brother, a neighbour, an auntie, an uncle, a father-in-law, someone who could be the grunt, be the heavy lifting, or be the knowledge and say, okay, this is how you screed. Let's start small and let's do it. So, you know, I'm sure everyone knows someone who could give them the advice or the idea but, you know, we've been pretty good making our little videos that are up online. I've actually got thank you notes and stuff from people right around the world who have been following our little ad bribe videos on how to build retaining walls and how to do paving. And I'm a smash hit in Korea, which is fantastic. If I'm ever allowed to go there, I've been promised free accommodation everywhere to have a look at their Versa walls, which is quite funny. But to do those little DIY jobs, and I try to recommend people do stuff like if you wanted to pave the backyard, and you go, oh, it's 100 square metres. So that's a fair investment. Say you're spending $50 a metre, that's $5,000 in pavers. With sand and road base, you might be getting up to $6,000. Before you do that, go and do the area where your garbage bin sits, and it might only be two square metres. And it's just putting your toe in the water to see if you actually can sink or swim. And it doesn't really matter if it's the garbage bin area. Like if it's a awful job, well, you had a crack and it doesn't matter but you know that you need more than your skill base to get that 100 metres done. And it's no shame to get help and, and or even get a contractor in to do bits and pieces for you, but it is a sense of achievement and it personalises your house and turns it into your home when you start doing things around the garden. And no one wants to live in like a generic house with a generic garden that looks exactly the same as the next door neighbours. So, you know, your little points of interest and spice of life, which is what we're talking about today, is what can change and, and make your house look different to the rest. 
Yeah, that's good advice, I think, Jason. Uh, obviously, um, having a little bit of personalization in the garden. It's funny you say that about not being able to travel. I look out my window now and see some beautiful bougainvilliers uh, fully inspired from my last trip to Bali. Okay, Jason, so can we just talk now about the actual planning and landscape design? Um, I understand, you know, that there are a number of principles to landscape design and obviously for everyone on the call today who might be planning a project, it'd be great to get those <coughs> tips from you as to those six principles. Well, the first one is balance. Balance is relatively, my computer screen is just gone funny. Balance is um, one of those things that you don't know you've got it right until you see it really wrong. Uh, you can see those pictures A and B. Look, there's nothing wrong with either of those gardens and those garden designs, but A is balanced and, and B is balanced. If that was flat on the deck and you're looking across it, on the left-hand side would be tall and busy, and on the right-hand side would be flat, just lawn. Now, it's not right or wrong, it's just what feels good with you. And if you see the two pictures on the right-hand side that say symmetric and asymmetric, neither of them are right or wrong, they're balanced. The one on the bottom where it's not a, just a, a copy of the other side, because the lower shrubs are wider and grow into the other half where the tree is, well, it's balanced, but it's asymmetrical. Now, asymmetric gardens are easier to maintain because you're not same same like you are up at the top. The one on the top right, if you've got two trees and two shrubs and a hedge, then when it's out, when one tree's 30 centimetres taller than the other, or one shrub slightly wider than the other one on the other side, that's when you start to look like you fail. So the garden on the bottom right is easier to make look like a success story than the garden at the top right, purely and simply because if something's smaller than the bottom one, you're not going to know what size it's meant to be, where you are on the top one, because they're meant to be same same. So setting yourself up, having a very formal garden where you want everything to match just perfectly and look exactly the same is how you fail when one of them starts to not grow as fast as the other one. Then you prune this one and it looks different because it's got shorter branches. So asymmetric is easier, but having balance in the garden is important no matter. And it's just another form of scale. So balance and scale are two very important things. Speaking of proportion, Jason. Proportion is important and how you sort of train your eye to appreciate this and how you think about it when you're starting a garden is quite complicated. If you go into a hardware, Bunnings, a nursery, somewhere like that, and you look at a tiny little pot that's this big and you want to buy a plant and the plant's only 30 centimetres tall, it's only this big, and you go, oh, that's cute, but it's going to end up being twice the height of the house. Without any knowledge, well, that's just trying to like trying to win a lotto. So knowing your plants, and it's never been easier to know what plants you want to put into your garden. I mean, Pinterest is unbelievable. But if you just Google nice looking gardens for my house, 100 gardens will come up where you can look at photos. Click on the garden, take a screenshot of it, walk into the nursery and say, does this plant work in my north facing we get full sun all day, every day. Or does this plant work in the shade along my north-facing fence where I get no sun for half the year? And they might say, no, but here's a plant that gets to the same height it does. If you look at that photo there where it says in proportionate and proportionate, now that's a little bit unfair because the one on the left, if you moved it forward, you can see this pen. It's right near my nose, so it looks really big. It's as big as my face. But if I move it out here to where the camera is, it looks much bigger. It's the same pen, but it just depends on where it's planted is how big it looks. So small things in the foreground can look quite big. I always talk to people about when they want privacy in their backyard, and they say, oh, we need to hedge off the neighbours. I want something that's 10 metres tall. And then I go, okay, let's stand at the back door and see how high you really need it to be. And you stand at the back door and you use your hand and you line your hand up with what you don't want to see, and that's the height that you need. And it might only be two metres. It might only be 200 mil higher than the fence and you can't see anyone. But they think they need this great big hedge. And the difference between looking after a 20 metre hedge and a two metre hedge is lots and lots of hours, energy, effort and money if you're paying someone to do it. So, you know, having the sense of proportion is important. You don't want overbearing walls. You don't want things that are too tall. You don't want pergolas that feel like they're two stories high, but you don't want one that you're scared to walk underneath either. 
Um, and the best way to eliminate mistakes is copy someone. Copy something that you really like. Find a, I, when I've got clients and I'm taking them through garden design, they go, we know nothing, we've got black thumbs. I go for a walk up and down their street. I say, tell me what you like and tell me what you don't like. And then I'll take them to the worst house and I'll go, this one works because those three plants are still there, that retaining wall is still there, it's never been looked after and it's doing well. And so you take the best things out of the worst house, then you go and find the rich, expensive house that's just been finished 12 months ago and you work on the style like that, but go and find the bones from the really bad house that has still survived for generations. Good advice. And tying it together with Unity. So Unity is a good one. It's funny, like you don't think about, these words sound like we're talking about the world, but you can have a garden that looks disjointed. One of the tricks is I like to plant in odd numbers. So three, five, seven, nine. If you if you plant in even numbers, you tend to count them. Whether you're trying to or not, our brains are geared up to two, four, six, eight, ten. After that, they just become thumps. But in odd numbers, and the reason why that works really well is again, they can be the plants can be different sizes. And you know, it's just like me and my brother and my sister. We all come from the same mother and we all come from the same father. But I'm about 25 kilos heavier than both of them and about a foot taller than both of them. And so, you know, three plants can do different things. There's very few things that want to look exactly the same. Some do. But when you plant in threes and fives and sevens, they can be odd. So even things like stepping stones or I like to do large 600 by 400 steppers and I do two wide and I use them as my steppers. I use the Eurostone but I'll still try to do three or five or seven rather than two, four or six. So plants and a few materials in the garden. And, you know, a smarter man than me will tell you why, but we don't count odd numbers and they actually relax our mind and we do count odd even numbers and that kind of just another layer of stress that we don't need. Perfect. And what about form, Jason? Form is important just for contrast. So, I mean, we've got pictures up there of plants, but that's everything to do with the garden. So. You know, some decking next to some concrete next to some pavers, you might think it'll look like a spew, like all those materials. But if you get it right, it can, or they can all complement each other. So I, I really like to use dark charcoal with stone, Euro stone, which is the 600 by 400. I also like to use the Haven brick, which is one of the cheaper products you've got, which is six, uh, 400 by 200 in the charcoal. And I think those dark colours look fantastic with the, dark chocolates of our Australian hardwoods and Merbau, which is a relatively cheap and environmentally sourced hardwood these days. Uh, lots of people didn't like Merbau because it was coming out of rainforest, but it's um, all coming, it's timber, it's coming out of forest, but it's responsibly sourced these days. And I have no problems using it. And I love the dark colour contrasting with the charcoal. And the dark colours are probably more of a Victorian garden thing than a New South Wales or a Queensland garden where we go for sandy coloured products bright and light but when you think about it we live in the sunniest country in the world if you walk outside and you're walking on things that are bright and light like sandstone and limestone chances are you've got sunglasses on and they're hard to keep clean so i like the darker colors the form of different materials on the ground so the contrast of that color of merbau the dark charcoal of the paver the beautiful green lawn and then that form can go to the size of the leaf of the plants that you put in the garden something like morea which is a hedge has a tiny little leaf about this big, and then viburnum has a leaf about this big, and community japonica this big. So you create texture in the garden by picking different size plants, not the sorry, different size foliage of the plants. That's why our native strappy grasses are so popular, just another form in the garden which can move lightly in the wind. So form is important to create interest, um, but also it's another way of creating balance. Um, so if you've got things that are all large, then your garden's going to look sort of a bit dumb and a bit big. And if you've got everything that's fine, there's no contrast there. And so you haven't created any interest. And you mentioned texture, Jason, as well? Texture's probably the, the twin of form because that texture in foliage is exactly the same, having all the different sizes. But texture from walking from a hardwood deck to a nice textured paver onto a lawn, um, I don't know about you, but they're all things that I remember doing barefoot my whole life. So, you know, the darker the colour, um, the more warmth you might get under your foot, which mightn't be necessarily a bad thing. Um, in direct sunlight, you might think about a lighter colour. We've got sandstones and, and uh, honeycombs, I think, another colour. Um, oatmeal, sorry, oatmeal is a good colour. 
But I like the darker colours. Plant if you're planted well with deciduous trees, which drop their leaves in winter, you let the the summer the winter light in, and then shade them out in summer. You won't have a problem. And I just think they're easier to maintain in a darker colour. But look, contrasting your retaining walls, even your garden edge up there. There's a really good little product. It's just a lawn edge. You can buy it in 200 mil length. Uh, mil length. That contrast next to a beautiful lush green grass and separation to your mulch and your garden bed, that's another way of adding colour, texture, form to your garden. And lucky last, Jason. What's that one? I've just dropped the top of the page. Oh, Ambience. it's my one. Your one. Ambience, ladies and gentlemen, ambience. I think that ambience is the most important thing you want to achieve in any space you want to spend time in. Ambience is the reason why you look forward to going to your local coffee shop. Ambience is the reason why you like going on a certain drive down a certain road along the coast. You can't probably put your finger on what it is, but it's ambience. It's the reason why you like that space. So whether it's a fire pit or a water feature, whether it's just garden lights at night, however you create the ambience that makes you want to use that space more is super, you know, that, that's your personal touch. And my version of ambience is a space that I want to spend time in on my own where I'm, you know, contemplating the next week or just want to relax, just want to switch the brain off. I find I do that really well around a fire pit. And then it's also the space I want to spend time with my partner where we can just be ourselves, comfortable, relaxed. It's the place where I want to watch the kids grow up and it's the place I want to entertain you. So if you can get the ambience right and it comes down to scale, so you don't want to sit in the backyard that's a 1,000 square metres on your own and go, I should have made it. But if I can go into a little nook or a little cranny, a little courtyard that we've created that it feels like a great big cuddle by nature, I'm happy to be alone. Then you could use that same space with your partner where it's just you two reading books or having a drink and relaxing, catching up on the day. That's perfect. Then I might go to a bigger space where it's all of us and we're the, these days with pizza ovens and finger food and tapas and all that sort of stuff. But I reckon it's, there's that much of a necessity for the formal table and chairs outside like there used to be. I reckon there's more, you know, couches, outdoor furniture where you can sit and relax and spend a lot of time there. I like a zone like that. And then I like the zone where I could have three or four families over at someone's birthday party. There's 20 kids running a muck and, you know, we've got the big open space. So that's my version of ambience. It probably starts from my parents' garden where I used to see everyone spill out into the backyard because the house was too small and hot on Christmas Day to a little area near the barbecue where I just sat with my dad and learned more there than I ever did at school. So creating ambience, that's the memories that we're going to take forward with us and that's how you, that's why you fall in love with the house. So ambience might be a fancy word for connection, but I have such strong memories of my parents' backyard because of the different little areas and how we use them and I think it's really important that rather than just parking the car and walking inside and going, we own real estate, we'll sell this one day and make money. Creating that ambience is probably the most important thing you can do for the memory bank. Okay, perfect. So, Jason, obviously you've shared with us there the six planning considerations. Um, as you know, we've just put together a very short video to show everybody watching just the size of the, the transformation that can be made with a backyard renovation. So for everyone's benefit, this will run for about 45 seconds and then Jason will pick up some commentary on those projects. So this video will just load. Up. Just a quick question, was I on camera then or was I dancing by myself? It looked like you were having a lot of fun. So we obviously see, Jason, there are a lot of before and afters. I know that you personally designed some of those gardens. You know, we talked about the four investments, but it really is great just seeing how much of a difference some of those projects can make. And 
mean, you you were there personally doing those. I think none of those projects took more than you know a couple of weeks to complete. Is that right? Yeah, look, they were all um, little videos that we've made for Ed Bryan over the last sort of five or six years. Um, look, any garden, whether I'm doing it for a television show for you guys or for homeowners or investors, developers, um, you need to take a few essential things into account. So I reckon the first one is your lifestyle. Like, I love gardening, but don't get me wrong. I like hanging out, mucking around, watching the kids grow up, playing with my dog. I bought an old tractor. I like driving that. So as far as gardening goes, I do not want to be a slave to gardening. So my number one thing when I build a garden for myself would be I want to enjoy living in this space rather than working on this space. So I don't want a garden that's like a needy newborn baby. I want a garden that's like a cranky old man that's going to look after himself. And so plant selection, materials that I use, I'm not going for high-end roses that need pruning all the time. If I want a rose, it'll be a bush rose that can grow wild. And while it's messy and wild, it looks fantastic compared to a standard rose that needs to be pruned and shaped twice a year and fed three times a year. And I just don't want needy gardens. So that's my sort of first consideration is lifestyle. And that should be yours too. How many kids you got? How busy are you? How inclined are you to spend one hour a week on the garden, four hours a week on the garden? Do I want to dedicate a day a week to the garden for how much time you want? And good luck to everyone who wants to. And I tell you, I have to. I admire you. I've met thousands and thousands of you. And my parents were definitely those kind of gardeners. My parents would buy a plant. It wouldn't do very well. So they'd move it and then they'd prune it and then they'd feed it. And then it still wouldn't do very well. So they'd move it somewhere else. And then they'd move it and feed it and water it and move it and feed it and water it. And they'd talk about it at dinner and they'd worry about it. And it cost $9 three years ago. But they spend forty dollars in fertilizer on trying to keep it alive, and then it goes next to the shed to where all the plants slowly die. Where I would prefer to go and buy something like uh, Lamandra. It's ten bucks. It's Australian native, and it just grows. It grows in a crack in the side of the road, and it'll grow beautifully in my garden, and it'll make me feel good. And it's a good investment. And when I pull up in my driveway and I see that plant, I go, "It requires no food, no water, no pruning, no shaping." It's doing its job, and it costs one dollar more than the plant that my parents spent forty dollars on and still killed. So, picking the right plants is the number one thing to improve the amount of time that you have to spend on your garden. The second one was probably your budget. I think it's quite funny that most homeowners in Australia would happily go to the bank and refinance to get something like a kitchen, a bathroom, or a one or two bedroom extension put onto their house. They'd even probably go to the bank to borrow the money to put in a swimming pool. But if you asked 100 Australians, would they borrow money to build a garden? They go, oh, no, we'll just do it out of our spare change. We'll just do it with whatever's left over at the end of the month. I think you just kind of, you know, it means that you're in the game and you might be able to get started, but I think you might be selling yourself short. Um, reality is your garden budget should be about 10% of the value of your overall property, your house and land. So if your house is worth a million dollars, you should look to spend about $100,000 on your garden. Now, that might sound like a big figure. Um, but just to get into perspective, if you ask any real estate agent, like I said earlier on, it'll be a great investment in your house not, and, and your lifestyle. So getting your budget together, and I'm not encouraging you going to the bank, but I'm just saying people do go to the bank for all those other things. But saving up and doing it properly, saving it up and, and, and getting the materials and getting trades in for, for things like maybe an excavator in to do movement of soil that you just don't want to be doing with a shovel on your weekends because it's just backbreaking and it's not fun. So knowing the process and having a budget, having a plan for a DIY, I think would be probably their most important thing. But for me, it'd be lifestyle. But for you, it would just be that organisation and the budget. And even if it's just something like a, a raised garden bed to put a veggie garden in, Still just write down some notes. It's funny, like I'm hopeless on laptops and computers, but if I write down four or five notes and say, I want to do these five things this week, it's amazing when I do write it down, how I get it done. And so if you're just building a little retainer, or say, okay, well, Saturday I want to excavate and sort out the footing, and on Sunday I might start on my first two corners, and I promise you by Sunday mid-morning you'll be that enthused, you oh, I'm going to build the walls, and you might be a weekend ahead. So just having a little game plan to budget, for any job, big or small, 
definitely makes sense. Just so you can know where you're meant to be and what you're going. Don't put any pressure on yourself, but it's really good to have a plan. And Jason, uh, on the uh, the where are you in the journey of life when you were talking about maintenance? What about that last piece there? I imagine there's a lot of people on the call. I've certainly given a go before, um, partially successfully. H how do we know um, whether we're up for the DIY job or not? Well, that's where I reckon you should either find the person who's done it and go through their process, their work, come online here, learn from us, but our little videos as well. But start off small, like I said, the garbage bin area. If, it's a ra if, if you want to build a retaining wall, Go and buy enough to build a, a raised wall for a fire pit. You know, like put your toe in the water and see if it's, A, if you're interested in it. Like it's, it's you know what? I hate painting. Paint's a strong word. I strongly dislike painting. And we've just moved from Sydney down here and we've got two tiny little houses and I've painted one back wall of one house because I thought I was going to do it all over a week when we had went into lockdown. And I did one wall, turned around to Lisa and said, I know my ability and I know my mindset. I'm never going to paint the rest of this house. Let's get someone in to do it. So it's important that you, if you're going to start off small, do it somewhere where it doesn't matter and you haven't ruined the rest of your property because uh, I guarantee you I'm still waiting for the painter and you'll be putting a third coat over my two coats because they're pretty bad. So don't be too hard on yourself. I'm not good at everything and I don't have the mindset to be a painter. I don't like all the cleaning and cutting in and all that sort of stuff, even though I like the finished product. But yeah, start off small, make sure that you like the idea of it before you've dug out the backyard and you're stuck with that for the rest of your life. So start off small and ask questions. Good advice. Um, Jason, uh, obviously, and not to talk you up too much here, uh, but one thing that you know I've really noticed and I'm sure everybody sees when you work uh, in the time that we've worked together is your eye for creating something out of nothing. And recently you worked with us on a project, which I'd just like to share with everybody on the call. Um, and maybe at the end, we can pick it up with a little bit of commentary from yourself. But as I think we'll see, fairly average backyard, and then going through your design process using some of the principles you've talked about today um, really transforms the project. And Jason, just because there is uh, you talking, if you wouldn't mind just muting as well while we play the video, um, and uh, everyone, this will run for about two minutes and then we'll pick up some of Jason's commentary. And I think this is a really inspiring piece just to see fairly plain backyard, what can be created from that. Sometimes it's hard to marry new products into an old house. If you have a look at this classic old weatherboard, it's got some brickwork, Sandstone crazy paved, lots of timber and a tin roof. Pretty iconically Australian. But if you went and put a bright shiny new paver straight off this sandstone, it would make that look as crook as rookwood, wouldn't complement each other and it'd end up making the new pavers look bad as well. So if I was to step back and look at this, I would probably think we need to entertain here and soften between there and what's here to complement the two but give it a contrast. So if we came out here, and pave that area and created some steppers through here. Now I've deliberately drawn them differently because I think I'd put a garden edge down here to incorporate this into the garden bed and you can plant this area out. A few ground covers. And then put an edge through there and then pave here. Now, a big, large, square, or rectangle can be a tad boring when it comes to paving. So maybe we break it up by introducing some raised garden beds, which gives us a little bit of height and it also gives us some extra seating because you'll end up with about three or 400 mil on the top, which even if you've got a big bum like mine, there's still plenty of space to sit. So when you're entertaining the masses, you've got plenty of room for extra seating that you don't have to drag out from the shed. Now in these, you might do something like herbs and veggies because chances are you're gonna put the barbecue out here. The clothesline has been deleted and moved further down the backyard. I reckon you'd get rid of this dodgy treated pine raised garden bed and you'd also get rid of those windows. So I'd probably plant this area out, still give you access down the side, 
with some more stepping stones. Good spot for hotspots. You could draw all the numbers on there and the kids could have a bit of fun playing hopscotch. But I definitely screen this area out with a hedge. And while you're waiting for the hedge to grow up, maybe plant this fence so you're not looking at this daggy old tree of pine. But I reckon the darker the colour the better because it makes the plants pop. So you've got your barbie, you've got a reason to be out there, you're entertaining. I use a large format paver in an area like this just because it makes the space look bigger and cleaner. You've got your raised garden beds with herbs and veggies in it. I might put a citrus in each of them. So you've got lemons and limes for your mojitos, if you know what I'm talking about. You've got plenty of room for your table and lots of reasons to leave the back of the house and to come out into the garden. Now you've got the space, you've got your garden bed. I would probably start here with pebbles and plant something that eventually is gonna take over from them. So mini mondo grass, zoysia grass, um, native violet, something like that. The two areas are far enough away from each other because this is pretty much a garden bed that they'll complement each other rather than contrast each other. And Jason, just while you're taking yourself off mute, I just wanna uh, firstly, every time I see that video, uh, I get quite inspired, but I just want to share something that Sue has put into the chat, which is sort of a, a benefit that we weren't even planning there. Sue said, uh, great idea, I'm going to take a photo of the area and design onto it like you have just here. Uh, so I think that's really smart. Jason, obviously we did this project. Uh, there's the befores. The people in the questions, which we'll get to at the end, have talked about having a blank canvas and not knowing where to start. Um, we can see what you've created here. Maybe could you talk us through this one and then also maybe just a, a, a really quick summary on, um, you know, how to approach a blank canvas because there have been a lot of people asking that question. That was a, a really good question about um, taking uh, the, the suggestion of taking a photo of the backyard. Now, these days with office works, you can get something blown up to A3 size for about 25 cents. So take a photo on your iPad or your iPhone, go down to office where it's going to blow it up, do 20 copies of them at 25 cents black and white and draw and give one to every person in the family and say, draw your dream garden. And, you know, over the course of the family, you might actually be able to mash something together, which is going to be perfect. The other one is everyone knows some middle-aged man like me who's got a drone. And so if you say to someone, have you got a drone? Oh, yeah, I've got a drone. Well, would you like to come over and take a snapshot of my backyard? And so they go up, take the photo for you, and you've got pretty much your plan there that you can draw straight down on. Plus, you've given some nerd like me a compliment because you've let them use their drone for something other than a joy flight. Um, with, with a blank canvas, it can be a bit daunting. Um, by putting those raised garden beds in there, we've got that element of a level chain, and it's also brings it into scale from the height of the balcony, the back of veranda, down to the paving. If it just went from the veranda to the brickwork to the paving, it would be quite a large drop. Now, we didn't have permission there, but in time, if that was my house, I would take out one of those balustrades and put in a couple of stairs so you could enter that area from where I was talking about with the stepping stones, but also the back veranda. But I think that it works really well. Um, the the right-hand side there, we've got breeze blocks. Breeze blocks were something that were massive in Australia. They're sort of inspired by Palm Springs in the States. Massive in Australia in the 50s and 60s. Um, and then they dated really bad in the 80s and 90s and people painted them or hit them with the cars. And now they're back with a vengeance because there's lots of colours that they can put into the mortar. And so they're pretty much maintenance free. Where a generation ago, they just come in grey like concrete and then you'd have to paint them and they'd get dusty. But no, in that corner at the moment when we designed it, it had a sand pit in it for a young family. Um, the sand pit could be deleted, pavers put down, and the barbecue could be tucked in there and it would make sense because it's got its own spot. Also a great spot to put a fire bowl or a fire pit to create a different point of view and create that thing I called before, ambience. So not being scared to start with a blank canvas, best thing about blank canvas is you don't have to go backwards to go forwards where if you've got a garden that's already pre-established it's pretty daunting to pull out say a camellia that might be 40 years old and lots of people just can't bring themselves to do it 
And so you might compromise your garden because you've got some plant in some position. Blank canvas means that, you know, your options are limitless. Uh, I wouldn't be scared of a blank canvas, that's for sure. Perfect. No, certainly pretty inspiring watching that. And Jason, just before we move on to the seven projects that you think you've, you know, come uh, together, we've worked on a, a very uh, well suited to DIYers of all levels. There just has been a couple of questions come through. What is that hedge that you've used here in this particular project? Just before we skip on. Uh, you're probably going to hear this in every second answer to every second question you ask me, but that's a lily pilly. Uh, lily pillies are Australian native. Um, the reason why I use them, the reason why I talk about them is because they work. Um, that's full sun there. They'd work in three quarter shade. Um, we painted that fence black so that it didn't look like the messy fruit of pine that it was before. So it's pretty warm. It was really, really sandy soil. That house was along the coast. Um, give them some water and they will double in size in 12 months. If I had planted something else there like a camellia, um, they'd probably look exactly the same or worse in 12 months' time. Lily pillies are great for our native birds or honeysuckers. They all love getting in there and getting the flowers and the nectar. And There's just no better hedge plant in Australia than a lily pilly. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Jason. And uh, you've obviously been saying lily pilly for a long time. Tammy says, okay. we planted ours based on Jason's recommendation from TV many years ago. So, uh, Good on you, Tammy. <laughs> so, Jason, um, can you just talk us through, uh, obviously, a lot of us will be looking at tackling DIY projects. There are plenty of places to start. Sometimes we have a need, sometimes we have an opportunity. Maybe if you could just briefly run us through these seven. Um, and for the benefit of everybody on the call, We've also, with Jason, put together a guide for achieving these seven projects, which we'll send out uh, next week for everybody to have a look through as well. This sort of information, so moving into material selection and getting into, excuse the pun, the weeds of how to actually do these DIY projects will be the basis of our next webinar in October. But maybe, Jason, a bit of a sneak peek as to why you think these seven projects, just before we get to questions. Yeah, well, the number one entertaining area, that's the thing I was talking about as far as improving your lifestyle. That's probably where you spend a little bit more on materials, a little bit more hard landscaping, the paving on your feet, the retaining walls and doubles as chairs, a bit of decking. It might be the per square metre, the most expensive part of your garden, but it's going to be the bit that you use the most and it makes sense. Um, number two, the veggie garden. I think 2020 just has put veggies on the map which is great because if anything good comes out of this is that we need to make sure that we can look after ourselves, make sure that we can entertain ourselves, make sure that we can grow good, clean, reliable food. If you've never grown a vegetable, I recommend you start with a herb garden. Herbs are far more easy to look after. Things like thyme, basil, mint, parsley, rosemary, they're plants that can be in your garden all year round. In fact, if you plant mint, it'll be in your garden for the rest of your life. But those plants that cost a few dollars can really freshen up your, your culinary delights and they can make you um, look like you're a master chef when you're a buffet like me. So I start with herbs before I move on to veggies. Number three is your front yard. First impressions count for everything. You know, present your house to the street, make it look a million dollars. If you've got a, a beautiful green lawn with nice edges and the path's clean, then your house looks like it's fully renovated and it's not. And so people pulling up a one over in that first impression and that's all that matters when you're trying to present your house whether it be for sale or just to your house proud so i think first impressions you know, it makes sense whether it's a white picket fence or a letterbox whatever the detail is in your front yard just make it as, as clean and as nice as you can and you've won over people's minds before they've even walked through your garden uh water features are cool um a little bit dated these days i suppose jamie jury put them on the map in about 2000 um, but they serve a very practical point in lots of positions. Um, there's a very good chance that most of you have visited Sydney, if you're not from Sydney. Um, Darling Harbour, I think it's the number one tourist destination in Australia at the moment, or was, um, is built in an industrial area next to the biggest commercial site in Australia. And um, when I was a kid, it used to be a, a port where uh, cars were brought in from overseas. So it was a pretty dour place. And it wasn't cared for and the government built a road here and they built a road here and they built another road there and when you walk around darling harbour and look up there's about 15 different roads above your head 15 different roads three lanes wide that's 45 lanes of traffic there's a lot of noise and the reason why you can't hear it is because usually somewhere 
closer than what that road is, is a water feature that's making a lot of noise. So the of the water feature kills and, and nullifies the of the truck using its brakes or the bus or the, or the car. So water features can be a really great way to add tranquility to your garden and hide the sin of traffic or noise. Uh, when we lived in Sydney, we were 100 metres off Lane Cove Road. Uh, it's not quite Parramatta Road, but it was one of the busiest roads in Sydney. And 100 metres away, you'd hear the trucks going in the brakes when the lights turned red. And we had two little water features that just bubbled away, no, not intrusive, just a and that was enough to kill the noise that was 100 metres away. So it's a great investment. Plus, it just brings a bit of movement and tranquility to the garden. Uh, number six, side path area. Well, no garden designer, you know, that's highfalutin is going to say, your side path area is one of the most important designs you could ever think of. But a practical garden designer who's got a family, who loves his home, um, thinks it's a really important thing to do. Uh, if you look down the side of houses that are unkept, and it's damp and it's weedy and there's a bike that no one rode for 16 years down there. Pretty uninviting and pretty uninspiring. And that's when you go, oh, my God, how close is the fence of the neighbours? And look at the side of the house. But if you put down some weed, mate, put down some pebbles, put down some stepping stones that are light and bright, you can turn something that's pretty dour into something that's pretty aesthetically pleasing and practical. I'll give you a couple of examples. You just put down pebbles on their own and it's very good for that crunch under your foot, and it means you might hear when someone walks up your side path. But it's not that comfortable for you or I or our friends and family to walk on. So if you add some stepping stones to that, you've still got the sensation where you might hear a bit of noise at night if someone's walking on a way they're not meant to be. But it means you've got an alternative path to your backyard. So if you've got a six-year-old birthday in the backyard, it's been raining for a week, and everyone's boots are going to have mud on them, they can walk down the side that's pretty. You can move a wheelbarrow down there or you bin down there quite easily, but it just means that it's another fo another way to get to your backyard um, and it's an alternative that you wouldn't have if that was a weed fest. And, Jason, and you forgot your favourite. Uh, you forgot the fire pit, number five. Oh, sorry, the fire your pit. Favorite. Nature's television. Now that I'm not on TV anymore, I just watch the fire pit the whole time. <laughs> I'm joking, but fire pits are fantastic. The reason why they're great, they are nature's television, and when you turn it off, there's that much maintenance. So a water feature, there's still maintenance, keeping it clean, making the pump running, paying for the power that goes with it. With the garden, you've got to mow the lawn, you've got to look after the plants, feed them water and all that sort of stuff. A fire pit, turn it off, zero maintenance. And as far as ambience goes, well, you know, keep the kids away from it, but other than that, it, nothing sets the scene like a fire pit. A friend of mine, two days ago, we had a 28 degree day, and he went, damn it, I can't light the fire pit tonight because he looked forward to doing it so much that he does it every other night and sits down and has a couple of drinks with the family. So fire pits are great for, you know, if, it, if there's an awkward silence and you don't know what to talk about, you stare at the fire pit. If you're on your own, you can stare at a fire pit. If you're with your loved one, you're romantic and you stare at the fire pit. And if there's 50 people over, you can all stand around the fire pit. So it is a cracker. And I think that it's very iconically Australian that, you know, I'm not talking about standing around a 44-gallon drum, but having a little fire in the backyard or in a courtyard is very socially acceptable, and I think it's one of the best things I can do to de-stress and relax. In the last one. I can't read the last one because my ugly photo is over the top of it, but I think it's um, privacy screens. Hey, there we go, privacy screens. How are you going? Um, the privacy screens are fantastic because you just don't want your neighbours to be looking in on you. Like, I used the example of Mrs. Mangle, the lady that was on Neighbours and knew what everyone was doing all the time because she was always looking through the blinds. Well, she can't look through the blinds if you've got some sort of screen. So that screen could be lattice, which is a little bit dated and hard to paint and a lot of maintenance, timber slatting um, or hedge plants and screening things out. And um, lots of publicity and, and talk about vertical gardens and they're fantastic. And if you've got a big budget, go for it, have a vertical garden. But you can easily achieve the same thing with climbers and screening plants for a fraction of the price. So out my window right now, there's some star jasmine that's flowering its head off and Mother Nature or God or whoever put the greenness on this rod on, on earth that we are should be congratulated for the flower and the smell that I can wake up to and go to sleep to every night. So planting things out would be my number one thing 
for creating privacy in the backyard so you can be yourself. I love my neighbours. I want to say hello to them when I see them, but I don't want to see them all the time. So privacy for adding value to your property and plus that peace of mind and lifestyle and you can be yourself in the backyard. You can run around the nutty if you want, but privacy would be the number one thing for creating that. Another, an, Sorry, it would be one of the most important things for creating that ambience. You can be yourself if you don't have eyes on you. So, you know, screening things off is super important. I think we're going to try and tackle all of them in other webinars coming up in the future. Correct. Yeah, that's right. And we also will be sending out that guide as well, but that will be the basis of the next webinar. So everyone, that is the uh, conclusion of the formalities. There have been a lot of questions come through, so thank you very much. Um, mindful of time, so anyone that does need to drop off, please do so at your will. Jason and I will work through these questions. I'm just going to start with the ones that have been... Before, before anyone goes... Um, Look, thank you for your support. Thanks for logging on and spending a couple of hours on a Saturday afternoon with you. But I just want to congratulate Adbri for being so proactive in this market. We've made probably 40 videos over the last six or seven years of how to do stuff. And I know a joke saying people from Korea and, and Europe have written thank you notes. But there's millions of people that have hit onto some of them. And so that's lots and lots of people that they've encouraged to build gardens and make the world a better place. Adbri is Australian owned, it's Australian jobs, Australian materials. Um, there's no third world countries involved where we're getting materials from. And I just take my hat off to what you're doing in this market because it's a lot easier to go and sell a million pavers to a council that are doing a whole streetscape than look after all us little homeowners. And so congratulations to you, but thank you to all the people that have tuned in today. We'll get to the questions and there's a lot of questions. Um, so let's tackle half a dozen or so uh, now, Carl, and yep. then uh, I'll get to the rest over the weekend and we'll send them something on Monday. Yeah, so uh, just for, to reiterate that, guys, uh, when we've seen how many questions were coming through, Jason very kindly offered to address all of these. Uh, Jason will look at them all and we'll come back to every vo everybody via email on Monday. So just before I start the questions, I'll also take the opportunity to draw the winner of the one-on-one -on -one design consult. So... <laughs> Rum roll, thank you, Jason. The winner is Leanne McDonald. So congratulations, Leanne. We will be in, we will be in touch with you early next week. So on to the questions. Um, we'll just start. I've got a couple in the uh, list here, Jason, we'll get through first. I'll take a couple from the live lot and then we'll go to the ones that were asked in advance. As you mentioned, pick a few out and then we will answer the rest on Monday. Jason, we have a beautiful wattle tree but we need to replace it with one that is um, uh, better for hay fever allergies. What's one that's fast growing that creates shade? Okay, so uh, I would hazard a guess that there wouldn't be too many wattles that are going to be fantastic for people with allergies, purely and simply because of the pollen and the fineness of the, um, but to, to attract bees and, and stuff so they can get pollinated and fly around, um, that they are just known for having a lot of pollen. Um, Danny, she knows it's coming towards the end of the day. Um, so I wouldn't say there's a wattle that is low with pollen, unfortunately. And Jason, putting a pool in, what what are good plants around the pool? I'm in Victoria Beachside. Well, for starters, if you haven't started your plant in a pool, go relatively small. I mean, pool, pools back when I was a child were 15 metres long and five metres wide. These days, a, a six by three is a big pool. So much easier to look after and so much easier to maintain. Good news is with pools these days, the filtration systems are so good that there's very little salt or chlorine in them. Um, and what people usually think is salt damage is sun damage. I uh, went to a mate's place not so long ago, well, actually it was last summer, he said all these hedges have been fried, they've got some disease, or was it the salt water being splashed up from the kids? And I said to him, mate, all it is is the reflection from the sun. So if you think about it, if you look at the, ups, the, the uh, inside of our hands or under our arms here, not used to getting sunlight, and the top of our hand, the top of our forearm is. So you've got the foliage of the plant like this, while the sun's coming down and bouncing up and hitting under here and it's burning the plant. So most of the time, it's actually from the reflective light coming from the pool. Just like if we were on a boat, we get more sunburn in spots like my two chins or three chins. Um, from the sun hitting the ocean and coming back up to spots that they normally get the light. But nine times out of ten, it's not the plants. 
if you're going for a certain style, well, I think that resort style garden, the strappy leaf plants, the, the plants like Strelitzia, which is Bird of Paradise, Traveler's Farm, Bangalore Palms, definitely set that tropical resort style garden um, that set the scene for when you can jump in the pool and have a nice cold drink in your hand. Nice. And a couple of quick fire ones, Jason. Um, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of thank yous coming through, so thank you, everybody. Oh, no, uh, thank you. Good afternoon. Yeah. Thank you. And there's a good one here, Jason. Um, an interesting perception. I see many times there's a gap between the pavers and a raised garden bed. Is there a technical reason, or can you, I guess, can you pave directly up to the garden bed? You can. Uh, a lot of the time, if it's a small gap, uh, chances are it was just it worked out to full pavers or full pavers with a half and you could if it was 20 mil and it looks silly if you were to go if the pavers were say 600 long and then you put a 20 mil or a 40 mil paver in there it would look ridiculous and you're better off filling it filling it with a you know a small 5 to 10 mil blue metal and not making a feature of it uh, if it was 100 mil I'd probably just plant it out with something like zoysia or mini mondo grass um, if it was a couple of hundred mil, then I'd think about which way I should have started or finished the paving. And that's a really important tip. You've got to know where you start your paving so you can work out where you're finishing it. So if you're doing a courtyard and you're six metres long and four metres wide and you're using a 600 by 400 paver, it should work out of pavers. Ten pavers equals four metres that way and ten pavers equals six metres that way. You might be able to do the whole job without a cut. But if it was 5.8 metres... Well, you need to cut 200 mil off a paver somewhere. Do you do it in the corner near the house that you might see from time to time? Chances are I would. And then the outside edges that might go out to the lawn, I'd lay a full paver. So where you start is just as important as where you finish. Nice. And, Jason, as you mentioned, lots and lots of questions. They're broken into three series. Maybe if you want to take one or two uh, from these couple, Jason, and then, as we mentioned, we'll, we'll finish up by responding to everybody on Monday. So I'll just Good. grab one. I'll grab one here, mate. Um, I'm looking for advice regarding paving and plants between our fresco and neighbouring fence. Uh, is it too shady to grow anything? Should we continue our existing paving or mix it up? There's very, very few places it would be too shady to grow anything. That's for sure. Uh, if you look at the floor of a rainforest, there's ferns and palms and lily pillies that do extremely well there. So. Um, there's very few places that are too shady. Um, continue red brick paving or mix it up and use red brick and limestone. It should never be seen like blue and green. Um, look, as far as screening off your neighbours, I think the best thing is planting it out because it's beautiful, it's off the green. Um, it's not a hard like a fence. It blurs the boundaries, which can, even though you're taking up land to build the garden bed, it can actually make your backyard look bigger. Um, so I, I would concentrate on the plants. Um, Start by looking at shade loving plants, and I know some shade loving, some shady areas then become full blown hot spots in summer. Uh, but that's why I like lily pilly so much because they'll handle both. Perfect. And maybe just one more from here, Jason. What are the pros and cons when laying pavers on sand versus cement? Okay, so both good. Uh, Victorians love landscapers, love laying pavers on a, a wet mortar mix. New South Wales, we like laying it on wash river sand. Both good. Um, I have no qualms in doing driveways on concrete and then on sand and laying my paver. You mud the edges in so that it's all locked in and can't move anywhere. And each paver is designed to move. Plenty tiny, you're not going to see it like I'm waving my hands, but as the car drives over it, they just move. That's why you lay them with a couple of mil gaps so they don't chip each other. But I like laying them on sand. Hey, you screed the sand, it's quick and easy for the pavers to go down, but it's also quick and easy for them to come up and something to be fixed or something to be repaired. And I use the example of the NBN. Um, lots of new homes don't have power poles going to the eaves of the house, which gets access to it. Lots of them have all those things underground. So if you have a concrete or a bitumen driveway and you get the NBN or you get the next thing that isn't invented or you worked out you needed more drainage or you wanted to put garden lights in, what do you have to do? You have to get a concrete saw, cut the driveway, put the pipe in, repair it. It'll never look the same. Or you can lift up a couple of rows of pavers, dig the sand down, put the drain, put the pipe in, pack the sand down again, lay the pavers, solve the problem, and your paving looked exactly the same as the day before. So I like laying them on sand. 
as they're intended. They can be lifted up, repaired and put back down. Perfect. And just to double down on that point as well, um, from an Admiral Masonry perspective, all of our pavers are suitable for residential um, pedestrian applications to go on top of sand. So when you're driving vehicles and so on, they do need to be laid onto a concrete base. But for pavers in the backyard, like Jason's been talking about here, uh, Adbra pavers, perfect on sand. Um, and just because I can't help myself, the question above regarding Adbra's uh, two most popular retaining walls, Versa wall and Versa smooth. The question is, why are they different? So one can be built to 800 mil high, which is Versa wall. The other products to 600 mils, that's just all about mass. So when we're doing um, a gravity retaining walls, it really is the weight and the mass. The Versa wall is heavier and a little bit wider, which allows it to go a little bit higher when it's core filled. Uh, Jason, there's a couple of uh, there's a couple of ones here. Uh, maybe you can jump into the top one uh, for us there, and we'll find one up one as well. Clivias aren't doing well. They're playing in the shady eastern position. All right, so Clivias, orange flower, look a bit like an agapanthus with the strappy leaves. Uh, if they're not looking well, very good chance you've got snails or slugs. Um, so what I would do is I would cut off any foliage that's damaged, which would be very time consuming. So I'd actually chop them down to about 100 mil, um, chop them off, um, protect them against snails or slugs with a form of bait, feed them and water them well, and you'll get new growth coming out of the center of them within days, and by Christmas time, they'll look spectacular. But keep an eye out for the snails and the slugs because that's what goes and makes all the dots and all the brown and all the dry bits on your clippiers. Cut them, feed them, protect them from snails and water them. Perfect. And another one here that you'll be very well equipped to respond to. Uh, so there's actually two related to turf and both about weeds, clovers and bindies. And then also looking at a new lawn um, in a new build, the backyard's full of weeds. What's the best way to manage weeds that are within a garden? And I'll add to that. I've got a beautiful uh, lawn out the front here, but I've also got a patch of clovers that I cannot get rid of. Do we start again? What do we do? Clover is relatively easy to get rid of, a simple one. Um, mow your lawn, let it grow. The clover, the clover will grow faster than your lawn and it will sit above it. Um, get some glyphosate, which is Roundup or Zero, whatever you want prepared to use. And two drops into half a teacup's worth of water into an ice cream container. Put a glove on, dip your fingers in it, and then just go and feather the clover. Not to the point where it's dripping down and killing the lawn underneath, but your fingers are just shiny and you go and touch the clover and that's enough to knock it out. It'll die within seven days in the weather that we're having now and the grass will grow through. It's funny because farmers love clover. That's what feeds their cattle. But yeah, in the garden, it's the it's the bright green bit that curses the rest of the lawn. Um, what was the second part of that question? Was it? Oh, no, sorry. Um, yeah, really thank good you. Yeah, both related to weeding, um, how to get it back to grass without spending a fortune. Okay, perfect time of the year to do a bit of lawn maintenance. Mow your lawn one run lower than what you normally would, fertilise it and give it 10 mils of water every day for three or four days. So 10 mil of water is, you know, half an inch. Put, a, put an ice cream container or a bucket out, put the sprinkler on. When there's that much in the bottom, turn it off for the day and you'll have a, a new looking lawn within a couple of weeks. The fertiliser when the grass will grow, winter grasses will stop growing. Uh, I use a fertiliser called Oxyfert. It's got a, a, a polymer in it which suppresses the weeds from germinating that are in the ground already. So it's not going to kill weeds that are in your lawn, but it's going to stop the seeds from germinating. It's called a pre-emergent that are in the lawn ready to come in for summer. So at the moment, any little tufts of green that you see in your lawn are winter grasses, but the summer grasses are just about to start to grow. So Oxyfert's the one I use, and what it will do is it'll stop the next generations of seeds to germinate. And by mowing it one low, feeding it and watering it, you're really going to start the lawn growing its spring growth. The stronger your lawn, the less weeds you'll have. The more often you mow your lawn, the less weeds you have. But the big tip, the one I like doing the most, is mow your backyard first, then mow your front yard, and then mow the medium strip, and clean your mower. If you've ever looked on the underside of your mower, it's all stuck with dried grass. You start the mower up, that dry grass vibrates. The seeds that have been sitting in there for two weeks are just germinating nicely. They've had heaps of moisture. They've cracked open. 
they're ready to sprout. Uh, the mower and the mower starts to shake, they fall on the first bit of lawn you see. So there's a hole on the deck of your mower, you stick your hose in there, you run the mower for 30 seconds, the water goes around, it's like a great big gurney under there, and it washes everything off. Pick up that gunk, put it in the garden, or pick up that gunk, put it in your green bin, and you'll have a lot less lawn, a lot less weeds in your lawn. And the reason why I say the backyard first, then the front yard, and then the medium strip, is the medium strip's going to have the most weeds in it, because the weeds can blow up and down your street. Then your front yard's gonna have the next amount of weeds in it because it's only got to get over a little fence or it can just blow onto the front yard. Your backyard's the most protective with six foot fences around it. So mow the back, mow the front, then the medium strip, and you won't be bringing your neighbor's weeds into your backyard. That's great advice. I'd actually never heard that one before. So thank you, Jason. And, and obviously uh, on this slide, you can see we have lots of questions to tap into your landscape design background from a planning perspective. Uh, again, reiterating, we'll come back on all of these, but maybe we'll just take two. There's been quite a few questions come through, Jason. Tips on landscaping larger backyards. This particular one, number eight, is three to four acres. I've seen a couple of other ones come up in the chat. How would you landscape larger backyards or we'll start? Okay, so one thing I really like to do is create points of interest. And I think planting an avenue which is like, you know, if you look down any main road and you see the trees that are down both sides. So if you've got a spectacular view, it's like plant the avenue and really tell people that this is where we want you to look. So avenue planting is a really good one. And just having stepping stones and paths through the garden, they don't even have to go anywhere. There could be a hedge and you just have a path that goes three metres either side. When you're on one side, you just want to know what's on the other side. So it creates a point of interest. And it doesn't have to be hundreds of meter apart, hundreds of meters apart. I like putting them in the areas that I call pinch points. So pinch points are where you always walk onto a lawn or always walk into an area. So it's always going to be compacted and the grass isn't going to do well. And you just do short paths because everyone's got funneled into that gap between the hedge. So you do like a landing or a path it creates a point of interest, but it's a lot cheaper than having paths running through the whole garden. I saw one there about uh, how do you garden underneath a pine tree. Um, yep. Look, pines and conifers are very good at protecting their turf, and by that I mean killing anything that's underneath it, like turf. So they drop lots of oils and tannins in their foliage, and you get this mat of cones or pines sitting on the ground, and it leaches in the ground, and it makes it unbearable for the root systems of lawns and, and plants to grow. Uh, if I was going to try and plant a garden underneath a pine tree, I'd probably look at bromeliads uh, or plants that can survive on the moisture in the air. So bromeliads sort of have a funnel in them and they survive on the water that falls into the centre rather than a root system, which they still have, but it's really just to keep them standing up. So bromeliads are really good and you can get them in lots of different colours. Um, I would think about creating pockets of raised garden beds. So if you've got a space underneath a cone tree that might be 30 square metres, get a couple of tonnes of soil, put a mound over here the size of a couple of wheelbarrows, a mound over there the couple of size of a wheelbarrows, and mound them up and plant high because the leaf and the, the oils and tannins aren't going to get into those piles. They're going to go down back onto the earth, onto the land, mulch the rest of the area, just have it as a rest, as an as open space. And then you could heavily plant these mounds and you could have the garden grow from that one and just pick ridiculous plants. Agapanthus will survive there. They'll survive anywhere. Perfect. All right, well, we might just finish on one very last one, Jason, and then uh, we will call it a day and thank everyone again for their time. What about small spaces? Just to answer the other side of the spectrum to that large area, where do you start? How do you create uh, distinct areas in a small space? Look, a small space is probably just as difficult as the larger space because you want to get everything into it and you need to get everything right because you might see everything from the one spot. So I think of a tiny little courtyard that might be five metres by five metres or something like that and you want to have somewhere to sit, somewhere to cook, somewhere to entertain, something nice to look at. You want your privacy but you still want sunlight. You might have to worry about where the bin goes and the clothesline. So getting all those things into a tiny little space might mean that you need to think outside the square. So you might have to mount your barbecue on a wall or have a retractable clothesline or 
your garbage bin might go into a box that doubles as, a, you know, a pot stand. Um, you, you can't have everything. You can't have your cake and eat it. You can't have a backyard that they're going to play football in if it's four by five or five by five or something like that. But you can definitely have a very relaxing and beautiful space that can catch a bit of sunlight, uh, unless you bought absolutely something at the foot of a mountain or, you know, there's a 20 story block of units next to you. Um, Again, it's research, it's Pinterest, it's Instagram, it's, you know, the magazines, the Sunday papers. One of the, one of the best things you can do is get on realestate.com and look at what's in your neighbourhood and what sort of prices they're going for and work out how you can do it to your budget um, because keeping up with the Joneses is not such a silly thing to do when we're talking about, you know, a million, two million dollars and that's what our houses in our metropolitan areas are getting worth. Um, because if you, if you went and had a five by five backyard and you decided to create a dry creek bed, um, you're probably scared off 99 out of 100 people who want to buy a house. Perfect. Thanks, Jason. And once again, thank you, everybody. As mentioned, we'll come back on Monday with all of these questions. Following this session, we will send out a very short five question survey. Love some feedback. That really is just about how you enjoyed today's session, uh, how the technology was. Um, and how you enjoyed the experience and the advice. Uh, we'll also be sending a link to this particular session if you would like to rewatch any of it or check out the slide deck and then coming back with questions uh, Monday and our guide next week. Jason, I might let you have the final word um, with thanks from uh, Burley here on the Gold Coast. I'll say goodbye and over to you. So Tracy, Belinda, Kate, Pat, Diana, Ruth, Phil, Archie, Rocker, Sally, Sue, Kerry, and all the other people that have been nice enough. Linda, Jado, Jared, Angela, thank you so much. Um, Saturday afternoon is a very funny time. In fact, one of the things I'd like to know if you, if you do have some sessions that today really like this, do something better, is what would be the best time to hold one of these? Because we've ummed and out about it. Thinking maybe Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Saturday afternoon. Um, it turns out it's a cracking day here. So, you know, it'd be a hard choice to come in and sit in front of a computer for an hour. So thank you so much. And like I started by saying, the people of Victoria, um, best of luck. Uh, we're all here thinking of you. And uh, if there's one thing about being stuck in lockdown, you can get outside and muck around the backyard. So, uh, personally, I really appreciate your support. Uh, I've enjoyed the 20 years that I was on television, the six or seven years I've been with Ed Bry. I love landscaping. I love sharing my knowledge. Carl, thank you so much for today, mate. Really well run. I look forward to uh, doing all this again with you soon. Thanks, everyone.